I'm struck by the word common wealth. The wealth that is common. Um, is available to us, many of us, perhaps all. It's common to all. They all share in this wealth. But I think of the British Commonwealth of Nations, um, you know, included things like Canada and Australia and New Zealand and um, India and you name it, you know, a lot of countries. Their commonwealth was, well, dare I say it, the law and order of um, the British dominance, you could say, but way of life. Um, its protection from other nations. Ideally, its prosperity in some general sense or of the law and order and protection. Its culture, its civilization. Um, its believed in birthright. Christianity, or whatever sort of mix it was at the time. Uh, whether it was, you know, sort of Church of England come tolerance of Catholicism and um, nonconformity and, uh, and so on. The Commonwealth was this common culture um, I mean it had its uh, um, less attractive features I mean uh, the protection was a dominance and uh, an imposition as well um, I mean civilization is isn't it? it it insists on a certain law and order but it's better than none uh, you know, no law and order is chaos and you can't build and invest in the future and um, stresses are enormous. But of course the word wealth was to um, stipulate or indicate um, something that is of value. Oh, like civilization. It's roads and parks and common land and nature. The particular um, well, climate and uh, Flora, uh, they're different in each country, but available to all in that country. So it was a commonwealth that was um, of value in some sense to life, happiness, protection, peace of mind. security of some sort. Depending upon its ethics um, and laws, of course, that seem to enshrine the apparent ethics of a culture, every um, nation is like it to some extent except it may persecute certain minorities such that um, they're not privy to, they're not experiencing 
the same sharing of some of the facilities. I mean, what we have in our Western culture is um, certain things in common, law and order and protection and um, transport and uh, parks and beach and riversides and some places in common in that sense. But we also have private property, which is not common. It's private to the individual notion of special rights, personal rights, ownership, private property. And the population might lament that there's a great deal of private property and is not the commonwealth of all. Most of the land might be owned by major land-owning legal persons that exclude uh, all the rest of the population. It was lamented right back at um, ancient Hebrew times that Landowners had started to put their strips end to end and left no common land for the poor. An infringement of what was felt should have been common wealth to us all. And we see it increasingly with rights that you now have to pay to be able to share in, I mean, not just um, land rights, but water rights and um, parks even, paying, you know, there are parks that are in the private sector. I was, I was amazed at this when I went to America. I'm not sure how, how real it is, but I got the impression that before the European came to um, New Zealand and Australia, really all the land was common. Um, well, except that in New Zealand, certain tribes definitely had certain regions. And so from the British point of view, it was considered an inhabited land. Whereas, I don't know, 100 or so years earlier, Australia was not considered inhabited land. Because I suppose the people that were in it were um, nomadic in a sense, and they didn't... Um, identify themselves as certain bits of land and exclude others. Whereas different Maori tribes did, and of course, warred with each other over such rights. In fact, you could say, couldn't you, that a nation, the characteristic of a nation that makes it a nation is that there are there is a certain commonality across it. Perhaps not of culture because of the history of separateness of different groups and regions which were more isolated at one time in the past from each other, but are now under one umbrella, like one ruler, you know, one king, emperor, what not. Um, who gravitated towards some sort of unification of what he deemed to be his territory. And 
and his people, all be they varied in culture perhaps. I think what I'm saying is that it's the aspect of commonwealth that makes um, people's way of life into a culture. Um, it's the commonwealth is the commonality in the culture that they experience and identify with and feel is in some sense their country. Theirs in a, a personal way in that they actually get advantage from various common facilities like its law and order protection, uh, transport opportunities and you know, access to its rivers and lakes and and wild areas and so on. It's common land in that way. If the gravitational greed of the powerful diminishes the aspects of common wealth, the culture becomes less meaningful, less civilized. That civilization is the creation of some common wealth shared by the many Perhaps not all, there are certain groups excluded, criminals and, and so forth, and the desperately poor who are possibly kept out of even common areas in large measure. And those with plague, of course, you know, especially what was it, um, leprosy. They were sharing much less in the commonwealth. Hmm. So we have an idea of what is valued of civilization. It is the commonwealth. And also in a, perhaps you might think a rather paradoxical way, perverse way, other rights like the right to have private property might be common to all and protected, of course. You know, if someone breaks into your home or car, you can appeal to the crown or, you know, the king, the rulers, the government, the courts, the police for redress and help and protection. That's a great benefit, a shared commonwealth in that way of protection. Our values are such that the perfection, the completeness of our God majorly tends to personify these values. He cares and loves all. They're all his children. In the Jesus view, he is our dad loves and cares for us. He's of great blessing, bounty and benefit to us all. I mean, religions 
hold groups that are exception to this. The ones that don't conform enough, the criminals, the outcasts, it has, it, it has its outcasts that are certainly less privy to the commonality. The sort of punishment for lack of conformity. The Jesus story, the Jesus story as opposed to Christianity, has much less of this. There's a sort of temporary hold-up in your full share of the commonality until you come to know God and understand uh, His fullness and wonderfulness and benevolence to life. Um, and of course the Christian notion is that you might suffer hell in the meantime. But there's something of that left in the Jesus story. You know, that they might know the, the only true God. Well, what's it like when you don't? You don't have the fullness of life, the eternal life. The dilemma of the child in any society, that there are certain aspects of the commonwealth that they certainly have, much of its protection and so on. Through the support for the adults that support their own children. But it's, it's very localized care too. So that one, one person's upbringing is perhaps nothing like as bountiful as another. Um, perhaps not, nothing like as free as another. And that, that aspect, the freedom, can be inverse to wealth, of course. The wealthy child is being trained rigorously and narrowly for a future, whereas the um, children of poverty may, because of the preoccupation of poverty and the desperation of living, the adults suffer. The child may have a great deal of freedom. Um, to be an absolute rogue, of course, from society's point of view, but but very free in themselves. Um, be taking rather more from society, stealing and so on, that, and destruction that society would rather. Um, the really marginal poor actually take Well, they're clearly there, excluded greatly from the domain of private ownership and property and so on. By violence, private security, dogs, servants that keep the, the vagabond away. But you can see how something like the highwayman was an extremely free um, person taking advantage of rather more common wealth than was acceptable to the culture. As king of the road, so to speak. What's your point then, Marshall? That heaven is an idolizing of commonwealth. And it's the commonality in particular that is the fellowship, the family aspect. Well, that which, the commonality is that which majors within the family, that its members share in its facilities. And some societies did this rather better than modern societies in some ways. Um, the tribal community where it was really a large extended family, unified in that sense, perhaps even a common 
building that they all lived in, Mirai, if you like, from the um, uh, New Zealand uh, heritage um, notion. Um, but the public hall, in the European uh, view of things, a shared facility that in some sense said there's a, a community, a, a common family over us, part, that we're in part of, not so much over, that we're part of. Perhaps the desperation of a sum of modern living that we find in the 21st century. Well then, in many centuries that have led up to this, suffer from this decline of commonality in some ways. In other ways, a great increase in such where we have things like national health and pensions. Um, quite wonderful in its way. I don't mean that such things don't get corrupted, but um, the sort of principle behind such is common wealth. But Jesus' understanding of God and we as children is to say something of incredible birthright to common wealth, isn't it? For eternity. In other words, again, our notion of heaven and God is some sort of notion of the perfection of that which we value. A family, loving, ideal, common wealth. Common in that we even share with God his loveliness and eternity. Love you, Heavenly Dad. Thank you, Dad.